Hello and welcome to part two of this our series, Chosen to Serve, Studies in Paul's Letter to the Philippians. Today we're going to look at chapter 1 and verse 12 through to 18. It was 30 years ago that I was invited to speak to the Coldstream Guards in Wellington Barracks, right in the heart of London, close to Buckingham Palace, of course, because these were the guards, the first responders to protect Her Majesty the Queen. And as I talked to these men after the service, about a dozen of them were there asking me questions. And uh, if you know me, you would know that I'm quite small. And compared to these guards, I was a little midget. <laughs> they were giants. And that must be how the Apostle Paul felt, for we know that he was small of stature. And these Praetorian guards were from Caesar's palace, and I don't mean the one in Las Vegas, I mean the real Caesar's palace, because these were the men that were there to protect Caesar. They would have been the crack troops. And the Apostle Paul was chained to one of these, eight hours, and then another for eight hours, and then another for eight hours. And so each day would go on for two years. Now, you might consider that that's quite a hardship. Certainly, his friends in Philippi uh, would have thought that. Uh, he's heard from Epaphroditus that the folk in Philippi are praying for him. And perhaps he said, you know, they're really worried about you. They're worried that you've already been in prison for two years and you've already had a terrible experience on the Mediterranean, 14 days and 14 nights in a storm and getting shipwrecked, and when you reached a place of safety, uh, you were bitten by a snake, and they're really worried about you, Paul. And Paul says, no, 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 you, mu you mustn't worry about me. What's happened has actually turned out for the advance of the gospel. He'd long ago accepted that hardship was part and parcel of what it meant to be in this particular race that he saw as a marathon. Uh, and he says, uh, look at it in Acts chapter 20 and verse 22. On his way to uh, Jerusalem, he stopped off at Ephesus and had a message from the Holy Spirit. He says, now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, knowing, not knowing what will happen to me. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prisons and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So Paul has long since accepted that hardship is part and parcel of this marathon race that he is running. Well, you know that at the end of his life, he says to Timothy, I've fought a good fight. I've finished the race and I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But along the way, hardships are going to be there at every turn. Some of those hardships are natural, of course. All of us have hardships. Life is often quite hard, isn't it? Not so hard for those of us who live in the comfort of the West as it is for people in other parts of the world, that is true. Uh, but hardships come and uh, we've experienced, all of us, this uh, pandemic and uh, its effect upon our lives and being locked down in isolation if you're living alone uh, it has its own level of hardship, but this is common to us, isn't it? And we must accept in life these things happen. There are forces of nature. There are bacteria and viruses, those little enemies uh, that get inside. And there are things like hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes and 
as Paul has experienced the storm at sea. But there are other hardships that come as a result of actually preaching the gospel because Satan is the enemy of the gospel. He'll do anything to stop people from becoming Christians. And those of us, which means all Christians, are charged with sharing our faith, sharing the gospel with those around us. And there will be attacks from the outside. You can't do it without there being uh, those that are offended by the gospel. Uh, I've been an evangelist now for some 60 years. And while I have uh, seen uh, many thousands come to faith, I've seen many more thousands not come to faith. And some of those could be quite aggressive in their attacks. But this is natural. Uh, just as there are forces of nature, there are forces of Satan that want to blind the eyes of the unbeliever so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ. And so these are the things that we must expect, just as the Apostle Paul was warned, so we are warned. But there's an even worse enemy, the enemy that is from within. That is sometimes the most difficult to cope with. As excited as the Apostle Paul is that the Praetorian Guard are hearing the gospel, and clearly uh, some of them had come to faith, because in chapter 4 we'll be seeing how some of the guards in Caesar's palace are sending their greetings to the church at Philippi. And Paul is in prison and he's proclaiming the gospel, but because he's in prison, he says, others are proclaiming the gospel as well, just as they should. Paul had given them, uh, in his letter to the Romans, uh, a mini-course in preaching the gospel. Well, perhaps I shouldn't have said mini-course. It is actually one of the uh, tenets of the Christian gospel that everything that is in the book of Romans is actually a foundation for our understanding the gospel. And they got that. He had taught them that. And so Paul would be discipling people just as uh, uh, he had from the beginning. And these people would have gone out in good faith to preach the gospel. But he says, sadly, there are those that are doing it for the wrong motive. Now, they are, they are Christians and they are preaching the gospel. If they'd been preaching a different gospel, he'd have had something else to say, as he did to the Galatians and uh, to the church at Corinth. Uh, he would not uh, tolerate a different gospel. When he wrote to Colossians, he gave the warning of the early form of Gnosticism, uh, or those that were from the Jewish side who wanted to drag people back uh, under the law with all its rules and regulations. But he says, that's a different thing. These are Christians. They are proclaiming the gospel, but their motives are wrong. Look at what it says here. He says, they're preaching Christ out of envy and rivalry. And in verse 17, selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me. Oh, let me tell you, there are few things worse within a church than petty jealousies. Uh, if you want to know, certainly in English, what God thinks about jealousy, just take the first three letters off and you get lousy. That's exactly what it is. It's pretty lousy. And uh, I've suffered uh, that in my own ministry uh, on at least two occasions that I can think of immediately. And how very destructive, how harmful that is. On one occasion, it almost drove me to stop preaching. And I, I think 
back to that occasion very often and thank God that he brought me through that period after I had been attacked by somebody who was uh, jealous of the gifts that God had given to me. The gift of preaching for me is not something that I stirred up. It isn't something that uh, uh, is mine. It belongs to God. God gave it to me. And so there's no reason to be jealous, but to rejoice, as indeed I do, whenever I see somebody else preaching the gospel. And if they can do it better than me, I rejoice even more, because I think, well, uh, they'll see people come to faith and God will use them. And uh, when I'm long gone, uh, there'll be those who are still preaching the gospel. Uh, so I do understand the excitement that the Apostle Paul has. Note, he still calls them brothers and sisters. He just recognises that all of us are on a journey. And uh, sometimes on that journey, we take wrong paths. And uh, that can happen even when doing the right thing doesn't just apply to preaching the gospel. It applies to many other things in relation to the church. And one of the things that we've got to understand when Paul is writing, as he is here, to a church, he's not uh, writing to individuals. When he wants to say something to an individual, he names them. And uh, he wants a message to be given Especially, usually, that's a word of encouragement. And sometimes uh, it is a word that makes clear that the apostle is not pleased with certain behaviour. But most of the time, Paul is addressing the church. He wants the church to be united. And nowhere more so than in this area of the gospel. He wants that the people of God should be uh, working together, each with their own gifts. Uh, some people can't uh, string two words together. I remember one of the people that I was teaching, uh, trying to get them to the point where they would be able to share their faith, and a poor fellow, he couldn't remember anything. <laughs> he had verses that he needed to remember, and he got them all mixed up. And uh, uh, I remember on one occasion, uh, I was out with him, and he was sharing the gospel with somebody in their own home. And uh, uh, I sat there and thought, well, I don't know what they're making of this. Uh, it's all over the place. And uh, it uh, eventually he said, does this make sense to you? <laughs> and you know what the response was? He said, it's wonderful. I've never heard anything quite as wonderful as that. And I can tell it came straight from your heart. I sat there thinking, well, it certainly didn't come from his head. But that person came to faith that night. Why? because of sincerity. You see, the Holy Spirit takes the word. It may sound imperfect to us, but the Holy Spirit knows what is going to be right for this person who he wants to bring into the kingdom. And what was important to that person on that night was that the person speaking to him was sincere. You can bumble all over the place. It doesn't matter. Tell the story of Jesus. Share the gospel. But oh, do be sure that the motives are right. No jealousy. No envy. No selfish ambition. No hidden agenda only one ambition, just as the Apostle Paul had, which is that Jesus shall be known. 
that a person will be able to come into faith because that's the goal. The goal is not for us to look good. The goal is for Jesus to take his rightful place. So church, get out there, preach the gospel out of love, in joy, and for God.